of you here on a beautiful, beautiful Sunday afternoon. Um, I know many of you. My name is Ann Corso. I'm the executive director here at Southern Vermont Art Center. Uh, and I have the great, great pleasure of introducing our host and moderator uh, this afternoon, Joe Donahue. Now, most of you know that Joe is a nationally acclaimed host and interviewer. Um, he's interviewed uh, many folks over the course of his career, and the historian David McCullough said, there's no better interviewer in the business. You will see that in the Arkell Pavilion, um, interviewing uh, world-renowned authors, and the three people that he is interviewing today uh, are going to give you a real treat this afternoon. Um, Joe can also be heard on a nationally syndicated uh, book show and weekday mornings from 9 to noon as the host of Roundtable on WAMC in Northeast Public Radio. But we are thrilled that he has um, agreed to host this panel to moderate this discussion on the wonderful launch of the Year of No Garbage. And I am very, very privileged that we can kick off the talk here at SBAC. So let's give our panel and Joe a warm welcome and enjoy. Thank you. Hello. Oh, we're on. How is everybody? Fantastic. Good to see you all. Uh, it's so nice to be amongst friends today and uh, both on the stage and, and off and to have you all here and a thrill uh, to talk uh, and to have such a great crowd on a beautiful Sunday afternoon in Vermont and, uh, and to celebrate this book which is so special and so cool and uh, that's really, really neat. Uh, let me, I'm going to go around the bend here and, and just uh, do it this way. Um, last but certainly not least, we'll, we'll have our uh, featured author Bill McKibben is a contributing writer to The New Yorker and a founder of Third Act, which organizes people over the age of 60 to work on climate and racial justice. I'm four years away. <laughs> he founded the first global uh, gla uh, grassroots climate campaign, 350.org. He serves as the Schumann Distinguished Professor in Residence at Middlebury College in Vermont. Also, fun fact, when I started my first talk show 36 years ago, Bill was my first guest. <laughs> Judith Enk is a former EPA regional administrator during the Obama administration on the faculty at Bennington College, president of Beyond Plastics. She also was one of the first people that I inter interviewed when I went to WAMC. I uh, was working for environmental advocates, I believe, at that point, and, um, and, then, and then just took on the world. Uh, I love her as a friend, but we love her most as a WAMC panelist who can be heard most Fridays. Judith Enk, ladies and gentlemen. Eve Schaub is an internationally published author and humorist, the author of The Year of No Sugar and Year of No Clutter. Her third family memoir is Year of No Garbage. It is right there. She has been featured in The New Yorker, The Washington Post, and on The Dr. Oz Show, which for some reason is still part of her bio. <laughs> But here, I got something better. But she's the author of this really cool brand new book called Year of No Garbage. Uh, all right, here we have the microphones, and uh, we'll go to you first, and then we'll, we'll go around the bend. Um, and uh, so we're going to talk to each, uh, each uh, participant for a few moments, and then we'll, we'll have a, a, pardon the pun, a roundtable discussion. And then we'll, uh, we'll come out in the crowd and talk to all of you. At what point in this year series did you figure, oh, garbage would be a good way to go? <laughs> Thank you, Joe. That was amazing, all the introductions, and I appreciate you being here. I'm a longtime fan and listener. Thank you. Um, at what point? Well, I think this was a, an idea that was germinating for a long time. I remember as a little kid watching Sesame Street and Oscar the Grouch, and he would sing about trash. 
But what I thought was weird was that the, the things he sang about were not the things that actually went into our family's garbage. I mean, I, way back then, we didn't have any uh, possibilities for recycling anything. We had one large black plastic garbage bag under the sink, and into it went absolutely everything. Whether it was food waste, whether it was paper or metal or plastic, you name it, it went in there. And I remember being a kid and having that curiosity, like, when we put it by the side of the driveway at, at the end of the week, what happens to it next? I wonder if it's anything good. And I, I, I remember thinking, you know, uh, I, I, I had this curiosity that never left me after that. I then went on many years later um, to be interested in other topics like sugar and clutter. And then I came to this idea of hearing a lot about zero waste and the zero waste movement and seeing a lot about it on social media. And I've always uh, thought of myself as being interested in environmentalism. <laughs> Um, and I, I thought, you know, I'm already pretty environmental, I'm pretty aware, right? I, I have a compost uh, pile in my backyard, I shop at the farmer's market, and I, I shop locally, and I bring my bags to the supermarket almost every time, you know? How, how hard could it really be to take that next step and go 100% zero waste? And because I'm a wildly stubborn, optimistic person, um, I thought I could do it, and I thought our family should try. So, did it, it, it as you were describing it, it, it does seem like that would come out of a year of no clutter, that it would be, that would be very helpful, and, and sort of be the next step, a natural step, perhaps. I think that's true, yes. I mean, there, there, there's a lot of um, crossover in people's concepts of clutter and garbage, and I, very, I have this very uh, stubborn idea that there's really no such thing as garbage. That garbage is an idea, but there's no one thing you can point to and say, look, that's garbage. It's all a matter of context, right? So it's sort of like saying that a plant is a weed um, just because it's growing somewhere you don't want it to be. So I thought, well, garbage is just stuff that's inconvenient, that we don't want there, and, you know, we want it to have gone. So what if we could find all the people that all this material could be useful for? And I set about, at the beginning of 2020, the year of no garbage, to find all of those people and resources and say, here's the material that you can now go do something good with. Early on in the book, you, you talk about, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> um, <laughs> we draw the line and like throwing vegetables, but other than that, please. Um, you, you, you talk about it in the book, which I think is, is, is interesting because, as you just mentioned, this is 2020. So you're, you're all gung-ho, you're ready to do this project, you're, you're, you're set, and then, and then we're in a global pandemic. Dun, dun, dun. Dun, dun. <laughs> and, then you, and then you think, oh, well, is this a good idea? Should we keep doing this? Because it, it's, whatever happens is going to be, the results are going to be different, right? Absolutely. Yeah. 2020, like most people I know, did not turn out to be the year we expected it to be. And so I had all of these ideas of, of strategies and techniques that we were going to put in place. You know, I, I had been watching all the zero waste influencers and picking up tips. And then March comes around and the world changed overnight. And all of a sudden, my supermarket wanted nothing to do with those bags that had come from my house. Um, nobody wanted to even talk about bringing containers uh, for putting you know, your food in at the local deli. In fact, the local deli closed. All of our local stores uh, that we had been relying on for bread and meats and so on, all of these strategies that I had thought, oh, well, this will work, this will get us that one more step forward, vanished overnight. And so we had to double down and sort of have this family meeting, and I talk about that in the book, yeah. saying, like, Number one, is it even possible to do this project now under these new circumstances? And number two, should we? Because the world is falling apart. Does it, is it okay to keep going and like, you know, keep washing saran wrap and tying rubber bands back together again? Like it's felt frivolous in a way to say, you know, people are dying and I'm here like, you know, if in my little hobbit hole, you know, and but the, the conclusion our family came to as a whole was no, there's never going to be a perfect time, and we would forge ahead and we would double down and we would find new techniques. You know, life happens, uh, the world is just going to keep going, and we, we still need solutions to these problems, which 
even though at that moment they were not the worst problems we had, they're problems nonetheless, and serious ones. No, and it doesn't seem unusual, because it's, there's some point during lockdown we were all tying rubber bands yeah. together. <laughs> <laughs> what else was there to do? Jigsaw puzzles. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Jigsaw puzzles. Did you feel uh, that because you mentioned, I mean, we think of garbage of so much of what comes into our house. So stuff we buy and the, the detritus from that and mail and, and things that just sort of naturally come or maybe not so naturally come into our house and how we prevent that. So if our, if our movement is limited, maybe the amount of stuff coming in is limited? Um, I think so. I think this was a topic that I first encountered and explored during the year of no clutter, where I talked about the, the house as sort of like an organism, that we bring things in, things have to go out in order to maintain a healthy uh, uh, life form, you know. And, and so when you stop sending things out, they get stuck. And we all know as, as human beings that that's not good when things aren't going out again. Right? So what I found was that I had a whole lot of materials that I, number one, didn't know uh, what they were. Um, the, the, the hint is, psst, if you don't know what it is, it's always plastic, always, always, always. But I didn't know that yet. You know, I'm looking at things like potato chip bags and milk cartons right. and facial makeup removing wipes. What is this stuff? You know, it feels familiar and yet it's very foreign. And so what I would come to realize later on is that this stuff is all plastic and it's all either plastic or amalgamated with other materials and those things are never coming back apart again. Um, so I had all these things that normally would have gone in the trash. No longer was that a solution for us. Our, our 96 gallon wheel trash bin that used to go to the corner of our driveway every, every week was sitting lonely and sad in the corner of our garage. And instead, all of these materials, I had to find new solutions for. And I cleaned them, and I dried them, and I laid them very carefully in a nice, neat pile uh, in the corner of my kitchen that I called the Super Awesome Recycling Center, which very quickly became like Krakatoa. It was, <laughs> it was overflowing, you know, no matter how quick I was coming up with certain small solutions to certain things, I couldn't act fast enough because right. I had to feed my family. And because it was uh, during the time of the pandemic at this point, I had not only the three members of my household we started with, but my other daughter, who had been in college, came home, brought her boyfriend, brought her, brought her best friend for a little while. We had this enormous household and we're generating more stuff than ever and more stuff to deal with. So my husband comes into the kitchen and is like, you know, we still need to cook, right? <laughs> like, it, it was sliding down and I'd put it back and then it would slide down again and I'd double down and I'd reorganize it. That went on for quite a while. I needed solutions, I needed answers, and it was hard to find them. So the year of no garbage, did it take you a full year to get to the point that you wanted to get to, or did you reach it prior to that and then it's just adhering to those, those values? We did not throw anything away for the entirety of 2020, so I'm very proud of that. Um, but unfortunately, that also meant that we ended up relying on a lot of solutions, which I now, after the fact, know are not necessarily good solutions or reliable or effective. Give us some example. Um, well, w one very good example that I think everyone can relate to is the fact that um, in, in addition to our 96-gallon wheeled container of trash, we also have uh, an equivalent one for our recycling. And so into that, our single-stream recycling, we are able to put any number of things, glass, paper, uh, cardboard, um, metal, um, and of course all the plastics, number one through seven. And so I'm sure most people in the audience are familiar with the resin identification code that's in the Chasing Arrow Triangle that's on so much plastic packaging. Not all of it, but a tremendous amount of it. And a lot of people read that on the bottom of the packaging and think that means it's recyclable. And uh, so in the case of our plastics, we were taking number one through seven and dutifully putting it in the recycling container and taking it out uh, to the curb. And what I learned later is that 95% of plastics are not recycled, regardless of what I'm putting in that container. They are not getting recycled. And there are a lot of good reasons for that and interesting reasons for that. But so I realized that there, I was sending stuff off in good faith uh, you know, washing it, drying it, making sure everything was where it was supposed to go. And I think so many people are like that. And that's something I want the book to be able to communicate to people is, you mean well, but there are a lot of systems that are in place right now that are broken. 
It is, it's so fun to watch you describe this year of no garbage and see Judith behind you because she's just beaming. <laughs> <laughs> oh, aren't you proud? <laughs> uh, you obviously have been in, 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 so concerned about environmental uh, issues for, for so long and been such a part of your life and your life's work. But for to pinpoint in on plastics, uh, especially coming out of the EPA, um, why, why was that the main issue? Yeah, I ask myself that every day. Um, so I was working at the EPA during the Obama administration, and I got all my best work done after five o'clock when everyone went home and I could actually read. And I remember so clearly one evening I was reading a scientific journal that said by, um, in the next few years, I think it said by 2030, for every three pounds of fish in the ocean, there would be one pound of plastic. And that just stopped me in my tracks. The ocean. The scientists are also predicting that by 2050, it'll be one to one. Every pound of fish, one pound of ocean. Now, I can't say that was my first awakening on waste issues. I mean, I've been a solid waste gal for about 40 years. The, yeah, ever since I've known you, this has been yes, your, your deal, right? My, my jam is waste. And um, when I was a college student, an activist with Nyberg, I worked on the New York State Bottle Bill. And that got me thinking, if you just have the facts on your side and you're a good organizer, you can actually pass really good bills into law. And in the olden days, you could do that. It's a little harder now, but not impossible. But I, I was just so struck that we're turning our ocean into a landfill. And I decided I wanted to do something about it. Now, there are many other elements to the plastics issue I would like to talk about, but that was my, that was my moment. And also, I think systemic important change comes from outside government. And so I had a guess who was going to follow Obama into the White House, and that was totally wrong. Um, and I was thinking maybe I stay on with the woman who didn't win. And, but even before that, I thought, no, this is new. Federal agencies are not the tip of the spear. I want to go back to organizing and work with um, environmental leaders around the country. And that's how Beyond Plastics was established. So for people who may not be aware of Beyond Plastics, your goal is to what? The, 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 the mission statement is what? So we're based at Bennington College, where I teach. Bennington is our home, and the mission of Beyond Plastics, and when I say this, particularly at occasional industry conferences, people sometimes giggle, the goal of Beyond Plastics is to eliminate plastic pollution everywhere. Well, why not do that? <laughs> Yeah. It's worse in other countries where we're exporting plastics. Um, Indonesia, Vietnam, now Africa. Because as Eve said, the only plastics you put in your you should put in your recycling bin, no matter what your lovely waste hauler tells you, is maybe there are markets for number one and number two. Don't put any other plastic in your bin. It very likely is exported to other countries. It's called waste colonialism. So you when you think of this of this work of, of beyond plastics, the, the answers that we can embrace, we can find where? Because this is obviously local, this is national, this is international. Well, I think the answers are, we start locally. I mean, what I do at the federal level is just play whack-a-mole, trying to beat back bad proposals, because this Congress is just not going to do anything good. States can do a lot on packaging reduction. Vermont legislature expand, passed a bill this year to expand the bottle bill, and the Vermont governor vetoed it. Um, and so come January, uh, you and sooner, you need to contact your Vermont state legislators to urge a veto override. But what we're finding, um, and you know, Bill is, is doing third act with grassroots activists, we are finding enormous interest at the local level. So local plastic bad bands, uh, showing films like The Story of Plastic. Um, we've got about 105 local groups and affiliates 
not in Vermont yet, which is weird. So we want we want a Manchester Bennington Beyond Plastics group. This is where you're based, for God's sakes. It's embarrassing. <laughs> yeah. I know. You all work on that. You're all going to be locked in this room until you agree to form the local Beyond Plastics chapter. I uh, I took my uh, my my well. My, <laughs> <laughs> let me let me phrase this better. My niece took me on a trip uh, to uh, the South uh, a couple of weeks ago, and we were looking at colleges. She's 17 and getting ready to go to college, and, and wanted to look at some uh, colleges in the South. And uh, I went in, and we were getting some we were getting some snacks for the room, and I came back, and, and they put it in a plastic bag, and I almost had a heart attack. I was like, Oh my God! Oh right, we're in South Carolina. I forgot. And, and, and that just shows the work that has been done to alleviate that in, in places like New York and Vermont. About eight states have plastic bag bans, but you can also do it locally. When I was touring colleges with my son, um, I didn't pay a lot of attention to all of the details, but I always wanted to go behind the food service and see if they were really source separating effectively. And, whether they had composting. So you know how all the, the parents would ask questions and I was like, do you have food waste composting here? Because that was, that was the deal breaker. Who cares about the out of control tuition? Are you composting? I, I, I was close, I didn't do it that. But what I did was they'd say, oh, welcome to Main Hall. And I was like, oh, but it says Thurman Hall on the top. And then you look up Thurman and you say, oh, he was a Nazi. Okay, got it. <laughs> like that kind of stuff is what I was interested in. But you, uh, so you think eight states can take on the world. I mean, if, if, if once you have eight, we could see this, like with the bottle bill, that this can move its way across the country. It always comes back to the bottle bill. I think you need to have good local examples, and on the plastics issue, and I think on climate change, I think the leadership comes from the bottom up. Um, you just, you go to your city council meeting, you go to the county legislature, and change happens, and then you have good models. What I'm really worried about, though, is the plastics industry is on to us. They know that people really care about this issue, so they're going into state legislatures and trying to pass, like, really, ineffective packaging bills. So we're in there toe-to-toe -to -toe with them trying to kill the bad bills and support good bills. That's a big priority for us in New York. Um, and then also the plastics industry. They're starting to acknowledge that plastic recycling has been an abysmal failure. In the US, it's just five to 6% plastic recycling rate, which is very low after 30 years of advertising. So now they're pushing something called chemical recycling, which is basically high heat or chemicals to deal with plastics. It's pyrolysis, it's gasification, it's always cited in environmental justice communities, and it makes the status quo worse. But here's the problem. At Beyond Plastics, we want to significantly reduce the generation of plastics, the production of plastics. And the plastics industry, the fossil fuel industry, the chemical industry want to increase the production of plastics. And that's the little dance that's going on in state legislatures around the country. And Bill, this is what you've, you've been fighting the better part of your, your career. Yeah, so first of all, what fun to be here. And what congratulations on the book, um, which is really terrific. When you first sent it to me, I had two, two thoughts. One was, oh my, this might be a little sanctimonious. Um, but it turns out it's not at all. It's full of good humor and grace um, and wonderful. My second thought, since I've lived my whole life in small rural communities, was uh, I can't completely stop producing garbage because then what would I do on Saturday morning <laughs> to see my neighbors at the transfer station? Joe, you may not know this, but the, the Vermont's, uh, Northern Vermont, Central Vermont's greatest radio station, we all listen to the round table, but on Saturday morning we listen to WTEV up where I live, yeah. and for 45 years there's been a program from 9 to 10 every Saturday morning called Music to Go to the Dump Bot. Um, <laughs> Um, so, you know, it's, it, it, I, I, I'm just going to pretend that I'm still producing waste, and, you know, just 
blow up a bag with nothing in it or something <laughs> and I take it down so I can see my neighbors. Um, um, look, uh, plastic, which makes up a huge percentage of the waste stream, um, is just oil uh, incarnate, you know, and it's the next thing that the, I, mean, I think Exxon is now the biggest producer of plastic on planet Earth, you know. Um, Exxon's also the biggest liar on planet Earth about everything and has been for a long time and they're finally starting to get held a little bit to account for it. It was very good to see the state of California decide to sue them last week. Um, um, but just in the larger sense of waste, I mean, yes, I've spent my life dealing with the single biggest garbage problem of all in, in volume terms, the amount of carbon dioxide that we produce outpaces absolutely everything else on the planet. But these are all completely linked together. It's the same industry, same system, same giant machine that we're trying to, to take on here. And um, I, I agree with Judith that to some degree, local and ground up efforts are excellent. It also has to be taken on from the very center because these guys are, we, we, have to, we, we have to be able to break the political power of the fossil fuel industry before we can actually uh, effectively win any of these fights. And that's, what, that's above all what I've spent my life doing, trying to break that power. So when you say take it through the center, that means what? Well, so for instance, we did, we've done this massive divestment campaign right. and become the biggest anti-corporate campaign in history. We're about $40 trillion now in endowments and portfolios that have divested from fossil fuel. Mark Dunley, who's here today, has been a huge help in getting that done in New York State. Um, um, they are a dynamic duo. There's yes, they are. no um, uh, way around it. Um, Vermont, by the way, has yet to divest its pension fund from fossil fuel. We're getting closer. Uh, this legislative session might well do it, so remind your legislators that it would be a good idea to follow New York, Quebec, Maine, on and on and on down this path. Um, but that's just one example. You know, I, I just wrote a big piece for the New Yorker last week, and I think it's going to be the next big drive that we do. The, the, remember, this is None of these things are domestic problems uh, entirely. Uh, uh, the fossil fuel industry is the most globalized of all our concerns. They have, they have they've fracked so much gas now, especially in the Permian Basin, that the only two things they can do with it are export it as liquefied natural gas and run it through these things they call ethane crackers to produce plastic. The export thing, America is now by far the biggest exporter of natural gas and they want to dramatically increase it. The story I wrote for the New Yorker pointed out that if we continue on the current build out to follow the plans that the industry has in mind and that so far Washington hasn't gotten in the way of, by 2030 that we'll be exporting so much fossil fuel that if you count it against our emissions, It'll be as if America had done literally nothing to reduce its emissions since 2005. So it's a global fight, and the plastics part makes that super evident. I think the story that outraged me more than any story I've read in the New York Times in the last five years, which is saying a lot because there's every day some you know, outrageous thing going on, but there was a story about how the plastics industry had dispatched teams of lobbyists off to Africa. And Africa, actually, a number of countries have adopted plastic bag bans over the years, mostly because the bags foul rudimentary sewage systems so dramatically that you get huge overflows and things like that. But the plastic industry has decided that Africa doesn't use enough plastic. They're undersourced. So they're dispatched high-powered teams of American lobbyists to overturn these plastic bag bans, and they figure they can quadruple, quintuple Africa's uh, plastic consumption. When you read something like that, you just think, I, you know, I don't know. I mean, I, is, is, our, is capitalism just a kind of suicide pact? You know, what on earth are we thinking? Like, I, I, it just makes me crazy when you, when you read stuff like that. We take the fight at the, the big guys as hard as we can, and we work from the local level and the household level. 
But it is always worth remembering, and I think this is my credo more than any other, um, the most, you know, Americans, if we have a default, it's towards the individual. And for writers, that's really good, because we get to illustrate a point, you know. But the most important thing an individual can do is be less of an individual. Join together with others in movements large enough to make some change. We were in here earlier this morning with 350 Vermont and a bunch of other people working on, you know, building movements around renewable energy in this state. Uh, we've got to do this together because we're past the point where we're going to make any of the math work one Tesla at a time, one vegan dinner at a time, one excellent author at a time. Um, we've got to do this jointly. When, when you were writing the book, how hard was it for you or, or what was the process of finding information that you were comfortable with that was actually correct? <laughs> well, that's really what it came down to was, yeah. what was a reliable source of information? Because I found out very quickly, I was making a lot of phone calls, I was sending a lot of emails, and it's amazing, you'd be, you'd be shocked to realize how many people are putting their products in packaging and they have no idea what's in that packaging or what can be done with it down the road. There's just a whole lot of, um, there's a disconnect in, in, the, in the knowledge of what, you know, I'd call places and they'd be like, I don't know. They were completely unhelpful. And like, the, you would think they'd have somebody on, you know, like this is your job to, no. Most places, no, not at all. And so I got a lot of misinformation, I got a lot of disinformation, I got a lot of shrugging shoulders. And I remember, I made this my full-time job, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And so I was persistent in a way that the average ordinary person cannot possibly be. And I still couldn't get to the bottom of these things. Like, what really, you know, like, is saran wrap plastic film or not? Is it recyclable in the plastic film recycling container at the supermarket? You know, like, that kind of question took up days of my time with emails back and forth. And, and not to interrupt that thought, but to interrupt that thought, <laughs> if, you, if you have a saran wrap, would then it be, is it different if you look at, say, like Kroger's plastic wrap or another, meaning they're not all created equal. Exactly, yes. Right. There's, there's a lot of different pieces to that puzzle. I talk a lot about it in the book. And right. It is very interesting, but at the same time, it all comes down to it's all plastic, it's all not getting recycled, unfortunately. But, you know, what I really needed at that moment was I needed an authoritative, definitive source of information that was unbiased, and really knew the story, really could tell me the truth. And that's when I was lucky enough to happen upon Judith Ink and her class that she was offering, I believe it was for the first time on Zoom during the fall of 2020. Dun, dun, dun. Ta -da! She came in wearing a cape, you know, and she was going to save the day, and she did. I wanted the truth, and I got the truth, and it was so much worse than I ever suspected. But that's the thing we need, we need the truth. We can't go on living with the greenwashing lies that we're being fed all the time. We need to really know that when we're taking all these plastics and putting them in the recycling, they're ending up on a playground in Myanmar and children are playing in it. That's what's happening to it. Why did we get recycling so wrong, Judith? I mean, there was a point where, uh, I mean, I remember talking to you about this on the show one time where I'm sitting there and you get your, uh, in our garbage, you were talking about the, you know, the big cans they drop off and, and we have a brown one and we have a yellow one. And you put, the, you put all the recycling stuff in the, in the yellow one and then on, on pickup day, you just watch them go into the same truck. Well, okay, now what? Well, that's, that's not the biggest problem. I mean, if you're a waste hauler, it's mixing Okay, but together, I spent a lot of time problem. <laughs> yeah. mixing them. But there's a good chance that your waste hauler has a divider, and the garbage goes on one side. Mm, and, yeah. but okay. It, but if not, then <laughs> if it's all going together, that's a violation of law, and you should call the New York Attorney General's office. When I worked there, we did a case against county waste. I'm not going to ask you, but you know the number, don't you? The number two, the New York Attorney General's yeah. office. <laughs> but it's been years. Okay, so, go ahead. Someone Google it. That, that's, that's illegal. But I want to go further upstream um, and just spend a minute 
talking about why plastics are not recyclable and why we're all confused. Well, one problem is the plastics industry has lied to us for about 30 years. And Eve mentioned the resident identification codes. That does not mean the material is recyclable. And here's, here's why. If you take an aluminum can and recycle it, it can be recycled into a new aluminum can. A newsprint can be recycled into a cardboard or toilet paper or some paper product. Plastics have thousands of different chemical additives, many different colors, and different resins. So you can't recycle it all together. So think of your own home. You might have a bright orange hard plastic detergent bottle near your washing machine. Or you might have in your refrigerator um, a clear plastic squeezable ketchup bottle. Those two cannot be recycled together. Plastics by design are not recyclable. So beyond plastics and another feisty little group, the last beach cleanup, we put out a report a few years ago documenting the plastics recycling rate is only five to six percent in the US. No one has challenged our numbers. You know, the plastics industry were not on their holiday um, list uh, for cards or presents, but no one has challenged those numbers. So all we can really do is try to avoid plastic. That's virtually impossible in any American supermarket, which is why we need systemic change. So we're working in state legislatures around the country. It used to be called EPR, Extended Producer Responsibility, as a boring, mind-numbing title. So we retitled it the Packaging Reduction and Recycling Act. Well, that's actually. It's better. <laughs> it's better. <laughs> <laughs> Joe. Sorry. Gosh. Um, but what we're trying to do with that bill is create environmental standards for packaging, just like you have environmental fuel efficiency standards for cars, for appliances. So in the New York bill, for instance, that we hope to get introduced in Vermont next year, plastic packaging would have to be reduced by 50% over 10 years. That's how we're going to get out of it with systemic change. And, and how, how, I guess I'm interested, Bill, in your thoughts on that systemic change of just why that is so, you know, I, I, so let me, let me just say, the book that, you've written a lot of books that scare the hell out of me, but my God, <laughs> Earth, with two A's, three A's, three A's, two. That is a frightening book. Well, I mean, it's a frightening, we're at a frightening moment. And of course, this summer was a reminder of exactly how frightening it was. I mean, we, we were talking earlier today, we had the hottest weather that this planet has experienced for at least 125,000 years. So long before anything we would recognize as a human society. And we saw the toll that it's taken. I mean, we saw the toll it took two days ago in New York City, which broke its all-time rainfall record for the third time in three years after it rested there for 150 years. The planet is out of control, and the kind of uh, hand-waving small changes that the oil industry slash plastics industry proposes, you know, usually amount to a, you know, one elevated form of greenwashing or another. We're going to do carbon sequestration. We're going to, you know, if you watch the ads in Exxon for the last 10 years, you would think Exxon was an algae company and <laughs> had like a couple of oil wells on the side, you know. Instead of the fact they were putting like one tenth of one percent of their research budget into anything other than exploring for more oil. In the plastics world, you'll recall there was this vogue a few years ago that said, we see these ads, we're recycling your plastic into park benches and you know which probably is one of the few things you can do with all that mixed together plastic which is fine but all you have to do is like wander through Hannaford's for an hour looking at all the plastic and multiply it by all the other Hannaford's and then do your mental calculation of how many park benches the country really requires <laughs> and you get some sense of just how you know meaningless these series of things are you've got to take on uh, systemically and really what that means more than anything else is you have to figure out how to reduce the political power of these guys that otherwise have their way so in Vermont for instance we can do a lot of important things and that uh, 
what, what do we call it now? Plastics Reduction and Recycling Act, the PRRA, the PRRA. Um, that's a really good idea. If we built a lot of solar panels and wind turbines in this state, then we would not be sending uh, uh, tens of billions of dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars a year, tens of billions of dollars a decade out of state to Exxon in order to bring more fossil fuel in. And that is the kind of thing that actually breaks their power. So here's where, and, and uh, we're at the part of the program where just jump in whenever you want, uh, but um, here, here's what makes my little Joe brain hurt. Uh, 15,000 people in Libya die in a 24-hour span of time. And, 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 that's, and that's climate change. Well, when in any world is that going to make any goddamn sense? That we, that we see that and don't do something about it. Well, yeah. And that's, I mean, truthfully, one of the, um, one of the scariest parts of this summer along with all the floods and fires and things is that it hasn't yet produced more of a reaction than it has, you know. That um, we seem at the moment inured enough to this. I mean, we had, Judith and I were in New York for this climate march a week ago Sunday, and there were 75,000 people out in the street, which was good, but in 2014, I helped organize a march there in New York City where we had 400,000 people out in the street. Um, the, the, that's the reason that we're busy trying to organize new groups uh, of kinds of people. So Third Act, which we started about a couple a couple years ago, happily has grown uh, uh, like Topsy. Um, I'm, I'm glad that you're, uh, like everybody else, headed our direction eventually, Joe. I, I'm sure everybody here is in the first blush of youth, but tell your, tell your grandparents, um, um, because the, the organizing that we're doing at Third Act is really turns out to be fun and effective, and we're going after hard targets. I mean, we've been really campaigning against the four big banks that bankroll the fossil fuel industry and hence the plastics industry, Chase City, Wells Fargo, Bank of America. Um, it is not easy. I mean, we're talking about taking on the capital and capitalism, but if you, you know, if, if we can make some progress there, then it's big enough stakes that we have some chance of actually changing the outcome of these things. I, I'm not, I don't despair, usually, because there's lots that we can do, and because, especially in energy, the technical solutions are getting, I mean, we now live on a planet where the cheapest way to produce power is to point a sheet of glass at the sun. So that's amazing, and it could produce change rapidly. The thing that does cause me uh, a good deal of angst is the fact that, that these are timed tests. Uh, climate especially, if we don't do this very soon, then we pass this series of tipping points from which there's no effective, once, the, once you melt the Arctic, it's not like someone has a good plan for how you freeze it back up again. So th this is deadly serious, all this stuff right now. Um, and you know, if for some reason you've been keeping your powder dry, now's the time to jump in with what you've got because it's not like we're winning on any of this. The amount of plastic in the world is going up and pretty exponentially and the temperature is going up. We're going to pass that 1.5 degrees Celsius mark that you've heard so much about. Well, we're going to pass that at least temporarily, it looks like in November. Um, so, you know, um, um, man, we're, we're up again. It. There's a lot of good people working on it, but we need to make it happen now at scale, period. The, the hardest laughs I've had in a really long time was earlier today, Bill was talking, and the issue of solar panels came up, and he was, he was talking about that many people object to how solar panels work. And he said, you know, I was driving up here today, and I was coming up the driveway, and I was looking at some of the sculpture, and I'm sorry, that's butt ugly. <laughs> <laughs> the solar panels are beautiful, man. That's, uh, that's the sun made visible, brother. Oh, my God.
When you did the uh, uh, urine, well, well, it's, you're still in the urine department, right? I mean, this is you, once you do this, you do this. The change is forever. Yeah, the change is forever. <laughs> so uh, my husband's funny. I have the most wonderful husband. He's here. He, uh, and, I met him earlier. He's very, yeah. very nice. And, and my whole family. Very I mean, patient. I mean, very, yeah. <laughs> the projects that I have done, um, and they wouldn't be as meaningful as I believe and hope they are without the participa uh, participation of my family. Um, and at the same time, whenever I have an idea to do one of these big, huge projects, my husband will go, you know, it's not just a year. <laughs> yeah, you're into it. He's right, because you <laughs> learn stuff you can't unlearn. You know stuff you can't unknow, and you don't want to go back. So the reason I asked that was the setup to the question I have for you, which is, do you feel you may have made, have made and are making a difference? <laughs> That's a really important question, and I think it has sort of two answers. I mean, I, I love to show this. I have this wonderful picture on social media, and it's a 96-gallon container wheeled, you know, the kind that we used to right. take to the end of the driveway every week. And now we don't do that anymore. Now we don't have a garbage service. We go straight to the transfer station. And instead, every week, instead of 96 yeah, gallons of trash, uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. instead of 96 gallons of trash, we now throw away nine gallons of trash. It's this teeny tiny little, like this, right? That's still trash. It's 100% composed of single-use disposable plastics that we have not yet figured out, food wrappings, all of it, how to avoid it. Right? So that is a big difference. It's a big difference in our household. It feels important. On the other hand, I also know that if every single person in this auditorium went out tomorrow and bought a bamboo toothbrush, it would not solve the plastic waste crisis. And I like to tell people because the plastic waste crisis is a depressing thing to talk about, right? I mean, I had a friend who said to me, you know, your new book, okay, I'm ready to feel guilty again, you know? like. The plastic waste crisis is not something that I want everyone to feel guilty about or to feel like I'm not doing enough and it's all about personal responsibility. Personal responsibility is important, but at the same time, it's also the bigger picture. It's legislation. It ideally is corporate responsibility as well. It's the big picture. So it's yes and no. Yes, we all need to do our part. We also need to push for the bigger answers. Jim? I think Eve's book is having an enormous impact already. Um, there's an unusual subgroup of people that I'm involved with who work every day to get rid of plastic pollution. It's about 98% women, by the way. And Eve Schaub is a rock star in that community. And people are really inspired by this book because she's educated people in such an effective way and with the Beyond Plastics crowd, he's like Bruce Springsteen. And um, when he, when the he, only he, crowd that I yes. ever <laughs> <laughs> And you don't have stomach ulcers. <laughs> oh. uh, but th this book is making a difference, and we have to get it into every library. And what I recommend when great books come out by Bill or Eve is break the bank, buy three copies, bring one to your library, send one to your federal representative and one to your state representative and, and then I endorse this message. Yeah. <laughs> keep one for yourself to get for. Uh, I have a question um, and, and this is, I probably could wait to ask Judith this when she's on the show, but um, I remember asking you a while ago because I was feeling really guilty about my Lego hobby. Right? And so now, uh, Lego had this prototype block made of recycled plastic bottles, um, and they're dropping it because they said that it didn't reduce carbon emissions. So what didn't they take into account there? This Lego story really has legs. I've gotten <laughs> so many calls on it this week. Well, first of all, Lego should have just done it. And, and decided, does it work, as opposed to announcing it. So they got three years of greenwashing press. And what they found was that it is very energy intensive, 
and water intensive to take um, soda bottles and try to turn it into Legos. Remember, different colors, different chemical additives, different textures. Um, what Legos doesn't advertise much is they have this cool little Lego reuse program where you can send your old yeah. Legos back to them. I've done that, yeah. That's really? Cool. Yeah. Good for you, Joe. Yeah. I see you in a whole different life. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I had known this years ago. I'll your show on Thursdays in Oh, good. We could have become friends. <laughs> it's such a weird litmus test for people. <laughs> but, um, you know, Legos now, unfortunately, they're saying they're going to research bioplastics. And what I suggested is Legos should get out of the plastic business. And it's hard. You know, everyone loves Legos. They're right. a Danish company. You know, it's children's toys. Who could possibly? Riley Club. Yeah, 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 yeah. So within Beyond Plastics, we joke a lot that we say we want to get rid of balloons. No, no balloons, no glitter, no Legos, no fun. Come join us. <laughs> It's a winning message. Are you all ready to ask questions? I, I, I don't. I don't know. When, I, I don't. I, you can make noise. Okay. All right. Uh, I'll come down. Um, are you all ready to take uh, to take questions? I guess is the big question. Well, now that I know you sent back your Legos. <laughs> yeah. Well, hopefully they do the right thing with them, right? That's the thing. A lot of this comes down to trust of what they say, that they're going to do what they say, right? All right. Suddenly nobody's talking. It's very awkward. I don't know what to do. Hi, how are you? Hi, happy to be here. Uh, this, I have to preface this by saying I think it's a naive question, but I really don't know the answer. And that is, what, if we got rid of plastics, what would we be using? What would the American public accept? that kind of thing, and what would be good for us and good for the planet? Well, that's, that's not a naive question, that's a kick-ass question. That's, yeah, what do you, well, so what do we use instead? Well, I, I could start by saying that I, I think a lot of the pushback, and of course there's pushback, right, because we're comfortable with things as they are, and, and changing that is uncomfortable. So we, we, we fight it instinctually as humans, right? That's uncomfortable, I don't want to do that. Um, I think it's a false dichotomy to say it's all plastic or no plastic. I mean, I do think that plastic is here to stay on some level. You know, there's medical uses for plastic that are very important. 50% of our cars are made of plastic. My eyeglasses are made of plastic. My phone, my computer. Are we prepared to give all those things up? I, I think most people would probably say no. Um, on the other hand, 40% of the plastics that are created every year are single-use disposable packaging. That seems like the low-hanging fruit to me. And we are already tackling it. We need to tackle it more with the plastic bag bans, with the you know, single-use cutlery bans, um, with all of, all of the programs that are starting to happen, styrofoam bans, piecemeal, here and there. But we need more. And so I, I don't think it's an, uh, an either-or, is, is my answer. Judith? And we don't, um, we don't need a space age breakthrough. It's a great question. And there's a company north of Albany called Ecovative. They use mycelium uh, as an alternative to polystyrene, and that's fantastic. But let's go back to reuse, refill. Remember when Stewart's only had refillable soda bottles oh, and yeah. refillable milk bottles? The little mom and pop company Coke announced that they're going to do 25% refillables by 2030. That's only going to happen if they stop opposing bottle bills. But the alternative to plastic are things we already have. Paper, cardboard, metal, glass. Um, and we should keep recycling those materials. I'm pretty rapidly anti-plastic recycling because it's a big lie. It hasn't worked. But I want to clarify, please keep recycling the other materials, compost, yard waste, and food waste. And then before you, go, you know it, you don't need a garbage can with wheels on it. Bill, anything you want to add to that? No, that's really good. Okay, all right. Bill's passing. Yes, go ahead. Hi. Um, I grew up in the 60s, and I remember time before all of this plastic stuff. And life was no harder back then. <laughs> uh, we bought all of our beverages in glass or cartons. The glass bottles, we brought back to the supermarket the next time we went shopping, 
That went back to the Bodman Company where it was washed and sterilized and reused. And mm -hmm. it was a great system because the trucks didn't go back to the Bodman Company empty using gasoline for nothing. It used it to bring back the glass bottles. And we all did it because we got our nickel back. So we were incentivized, it was green, it was a wonderful system. And I'm just shocked. I'm told that I remember when a man, and it usually was a man, drove around in a truck and brought you a bottle of milk and you know, <clears throat> did it and then you, uh, when it was empty, you put it back out there and he took it away and he'd bring you a lot of other things. You didn't need to go driving off to the store as often because he, when one truck took care of the whole neighborhood. And it was not only, uh, uh, you know, simpler in all the ways we've been describing, it was also, like, really nice. Um, 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 you know, uh, so I, you know, it, and, and actually, at least in a few parts of urban America, we're beginning to see a little resurgence of that kind of thing, and hopefully we'll see um, more and more and more. I'll tell you one happy tiny story along these lines, and it has to do with waste. Uh, in M Middlebury, uh, near where I live, they haven't gotten rid of uh, garbage yet, but the garbage, garbage man who comes around to pick it up, especially the recycling guy, uh, uses a pair of horses. And, um, and not only is it uh, more ecologically sound, but it's a great pleasure for everyone in the community when he comes by, the kids especially, to see it out. So I agree with you. It's worth remembering that the world worked just fine before we had some of the things that we now have decided are our requirements. Um, and that would, that, that's a very astute observation, I think. And, and lastly, I want to remind everybody that before we had saran wrap, we used wax paper which is wonderfully biodegradable, and it does a job. What I found when we were um, trying to come up with alternative solutions uh, during the course of the year of no garbage was that if I didn't know the answer to something, you know, how am I gonna wrap this piece of food, for example, I would look back to what would my grandmother have done, you know, and I, I ended up, um, you know, starting to collect antiques, basically, that I found in junk shops, like, so I've got a really nice, collection of Pyrex now that I use instead of plastic Tupperware, for example. There's a whole host of solutions out there if we can look to the past to find them. Yes. Um, do any of you have um, a relationship or are familiar with TerraCycle? A very toxic relationship with TerraCycle. I wrote a whole chapter about TerraCycle. <laughs> and then if I can have a second question, so incontinence supplies, um, that is, there are companies that make wearable, washable underwear um, for a certain population of people with incontinence. But there is another level of people who have neurogenic bladders and just, forgive me everybody, just void several ounces. And I'm looking for advice and help to get research and development for that other population. So that, because that's a huge amount that's going to a landfill. Oh, so uh, to go back to TerraCycle just for a second. <laughs> um, I, I have a... You're going to skip the best question? No, okay, <laughs> no, we'll get to that. We'll get to the piece. Okay, I promise. Fine. Um, I, I, I have a whole uh, uh, chapter uh, devoted to TerraCycle, and unfortunately what I ended up discovering, uh, in large part because I took Judith's class, um, but also from, you know, uh, watching the news and so forth, there are a lot of these companies, TerraCycle included, are being now uncovered as not necessarily always doing what they say they're doing with the materials they're supposedly recycling. So there's the Carton Council, which is an industry organization that you can mail off your milk cartons to. For example, they have four locations around the country. Clean and dry milk cartons you can mail to them. Um, who knows what they're really doing with these? But I, I ended up finding out that you know a lot of the stuff 
TerraCycle in particular, there's a documentary out, investigative journalism, where they found bales and bales of TerraCycle materials that were supposed to be recycled, and they're sitting in a lot in Bulgaria waiting to be burned at a cement <coughs> kiln factory. So, you know, there, this is very disillusioning and disheartening to all of us who are trying so hard to do the right things with these materials, right? So the moral of this story, unfortunately, is that there's no sheriff in town. There is no one who's making sure that the people are doing what they say they're doing with these materials. Mm -hmm. And we need to fix that. It's too important. Did you want to talk about your toxic relationship, Judith? Well, Eve covered it. I mean, I don't even like the model that you have to pay extra to mail something off. What we need to do is the stuff that TerraCycles is accepting is we need to substitute. Like, they were taking those um, cake cups, those plastic, yeah. right? And those sure. are not recyclable. So I think the most important thing when it comes to all of this deceptive advertising about plastics is don't let the companies take your common sense away from you. And also, we need systems that everyday people can access. And I don't want to answer your second question. I don't know. Um, I Don't worry about it. There, there's all this other stuff that we need to get rolling on, um, and I've never heard that question before, and I, and I appreciate it, but let that one go, and, and let's make sure TerraCycle stops deceiving people. Yes? I, I've always wondered what might happen if all of the shoppers in Manchester who go to Shaw's or to Christ Shopper simply took off the packaging and left it there. <laughs> Very rebellious. Let's go. Let's go. It's happened before. It, it's a campaign in England. And um, we actually considered doing it, but we didn't want to um, <clears throat> be too confrontational with the person who works at the checkout. Because um, what I think we should all do is go on the same day and give it to the manager, not the checkout person. And we, we've done events with Plastic Free July where we've brought, we've told people to bring all your plastics and we all show up at Price Chopper in Albany or around the country. Um, we're just trying to find a way to do it that doesn't put low wage workers in an uncomfortable spot. The concept is pretty good. You said you had a, an answer to that? When we were in Germany uh, 25 years ago, you could bring your own containers to the grocery store, and you left your cardboard there and the plastic bag inside the box there, and you put the cereal in your own container, and it was the responsibility of the supermarket to do something with that. I don't know what happened to it, but you didn't have to take it home. Germany has a really good packaging reduction law, which is a model for, for other countries. Hi. Um, I think there's an absolute ton of blissful ignorance in our country um, when it comes to plastic and plastic recycling and the misnomers about it. What if we fought the idea of mandatory plastic recycling? Because that would force a lot of people to throw their plastic, single-use bottles especially, into the regular trash can because we'd eliminate the ability for them to be blissfully ignorant about the entire concept of plastic recycling. They might think twice about buying 24 packs of Poland Spring single-use plastic bottles to bring to their kids' soccer games every single other night. Um, so why don't we fight against municipal state plastic recycling programs to send a message? Boy, that's harder than the diaper question. Um, I, I, I'm not ready to go there, but I'm happy to talk to you about it. Um, you know, plastic soda bottles can get recycled. Um, we want to see some innovation. So, for instance, um, we're all holding up our hands like this because we, we can't see anyone. Can you turn yeah, them off? The we should have asked you an hour ago. I'm sorry. We'll never be, none of us will drive home. I'll tell you, when well, they turn them up, you're going to learn this is a good looking group. <laughs> Where do you see them? Um, Look at them. Aren't they nice? <clears throat> all right. But can you, you'll turn these bad boys off up here, the ones that are in our face? Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, we love you. Um, 
innovation is coming, so I'm not I'm not doing an advertisement for Pepsi here, but they purchase SodaStream. You know what SodaStream is? You can make yeah. your seltzer at home. Pretty soon, you're going to be able to buy little syrup, concentrated syrup of Pepsi, and make your Pepsi at home. Very bad for tooth decay, but just think <laughs> of all of those plastic bottles that you can avoid. We have a soda stream, and it's glass. You can you can have glass soda stream. So there's a little bit of innovation going on. Yeah, you know, I'll I'll just say that this is, I mean, I you know I'm a I'm a I'm a rural New Englander. This is there are times when just being ridiculously frugal is uh, useful. For whatever reason, I find it physically impossible to pay somebody for a bottle of water. <laughs> Every time I do it, or even think of it, I think our society spent hundreds of trillions of dollars making sure that there was a stream of fresh, clean water available everywhere. And instead, someone expects me to spend two dollars to buy some water that's been sitting in a plastic bottle for a year, you know, uh, uh, leaching out chemicals. What is wrong here? So it, if nothing else, water seems to me the one place where we could effectively uh, 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 just, I mean, that's just dumb. We all, there's water everywhere. Uh, let's don't do, let's don't do that one anymore. Earlier this week, I went to Casella Waste Management in East Dorset. Two gi giant garbage pans, pails, folds, recycling paper, cardboard, plastic, metal. All goes into the same uh, giant dumpsters, which get hauled off. What is the procedure? What happens to it exactly? Because I know it's just way too much work to, to separate that. So it goes to something called a material recovery facility, or a MRF, and there's some hand picking of stuff on the conveyor belt, and there's uh, sensors. So for instance, never buy black plastic, because uh, the sensors at the material recovery facility don't recognize the color black, and, and never have black uh, utensils in your kitchen, because a lot of those utensils are from recycled electronic waste. So this is like a really tough um, exercise, but I couldn't believe how many black utensils we had in our house. We pulled it all out and threw it in the garbage. Um, so it's, it is mechanized, and not all of it gets recycled, but a fair amount does. Thank you. And the, the, if, if you ever get a chance to go to one of those facilities, I'll just say it's kind of fun. It's like the ultimate Rube Goldberg machine. They've got these big uh, blasts of air that blow through uh, and stuff by different weight. And well, magnets. Yeah, and magnets and everything else. Um, it is, they are kind of remarkable. Every time I go to one, there's the whole line stops because a plastic bag gets into the gears, and then a poor person has to come out and pull it out. You have a local material recovery facility. I, I agree with Bill. Go look at it and ask them to show you how much plastic actually gets sent off to a market. I toured one of these in the Hudson Valley where the Ulster County Resource Recovery Agency, my colleague Megan Wolf, who is here and wants to talk to you later, and we both want to talk to you about a whole bunch of things. Um, I said to them, you're collecting one through seven plastics. Well, what are you doing with it? And the guy said, oh, a waste broker takes it. I don't know where it goes afterwards. I just want to get it off my lot. I, I will caution folks that when I was doing research for Year of No Garbage, I tried very hard to get in to watch some of these processes to, to go to the recycling centers. They did not want me there. They did not. I, I said, oh, it's an insurance issue. Well, what if I sign a waiver? And they're still no. You know, so th there's a lot of cloak and dagger hidden. We don't want you to see what's going on uh, for the average person, I think. When I worked at EPA, I did an unannounced visit to a garbage incinerator in Long Island. Where's Mark? And I brought my mother-in-law. And boy, that, that company did not like it. But I got in. And it was terrible what I saw. <laughs> when, I, when I was a young reporter at The New Yorker, I did, I did spend a week at 
Fresh Kills Landfill on Staten Island, um, which is the biggest landfill in North America. And the thing, the statistic that really stuck in my head and is always, is that by the time it reached its capacity, it was the highest point on the eastern seaboard between Maine and Florida was the pile of trash uh, uh, in Staten Island. So then they, uh, eventually they closed it and started sending all the trash to South Carolina or something. You were in New Jersey. Yeah. So it's, you know, um, but it's, it's a, it is good to get a visceral reminder of just the volume of stuff that we go through. Uh, and it does make you a little, uh, makes you a little sick and then it makes you a, a little warier of just more stuff all the time. Uh, Judith, you mentioned innovations. Are there any innovations happening in the plastics recycling industry that are, can give us any amount of hope at all? No. <laughs> I mean, the, the big thing now is bioplastics or compostable plastics. And, you know, we may see, like, plastics made from seaweed, from mycelium. We have to make sure it's not replacing um, food um, that people eat. And my checklist is, is it made from fossil fuel? And it often is. Does it contain toxic chemicals? It often does, PFAS. And is it replacing a food source? So um, I'm just I'm just not really hopeful about the future of plastic if we want to divorce it from fossil fuels and chemicals. So we have a lot of hands up. We have time for about three more questions, and then I know everyone will be available afterwards. Uh, so show everyone who has a question. Show me your hands. Okay, that's more than three. Uh, <laughs> So I'm going to do some geography. I'm going to go down here. Uh, maybe we'll. Uh, so if you keep them short, we can get in some more. Did you Let's have a do quick a one? Lightning round. Yeah, the lightning round. Go ahead. I think I have a quick one. Uh, you said something about in the food that people eat. So could you set the record straight for me? Plastic and soup cans and soda cans. There, and it's in there, right? The microfilm. Oh, oh I'm, uh, that's not what I meant. I meant. No, well, I'm asking. Yeah. I mean, could you set the record straight? Are we eating plastic? Are we eating plastic? Oh, yes, yes, yes we are all eating five what grams do they do of plastic a week. Plastic in those cans when they recycle the aluminum can. So what do they do with the plastic in the cans when they go to recycle them? So there are plastic liners in aluminum cans and soup cans, and that when it's recycled, that plastic just goes through a discharge pipe, it's not reused at all. They burn it off. They burn it off. They burn it off, they burn it off. yeah. Can you talk about clothing? Because those fibers are very, very small, and they yeah, mess things up. So the statistic that comes to mind is that 60% of clothing manufactured is currently made with plastics. I bet it's higher, actually. I think I, now that I look for the labels and I look to see the synthetic materials that are in clothing that I might be considering purchasing, I, I have found it's almost impossible to find clothes that don't incorporate plastic. Um, I have myself reverted to, I, don't, I think we've made enough clothes. And so I only shop uh, used clothes, consignment. There's so many wonderful clothes in the world. Well, you're not so so that's, that's what I do. And I do try to limit the amount because those fibers uh, are coming off your clothing. No matter what material it is, you've got fibers coming off your clothing and you're breathing them. But the problem is if they're plastic, then they're getting stuck in your lungs, causing all kinds of you know, untold health ramifications down the road. So the, the less you can incorporate you know, plastic fibers into your life, the better off your lungs will be. Uh, two for the lightning round. One is, is manufacturer's responsibility policies. Are those an effective strategy? The second question is, are you going to take this on the road? Where can more people see you and participate? I think we should go to Hawaii next. carbon problem. Yeah, that's true. We're going to bicycle to Albany. We'll, we'll walk. We'll walk to Hawaii. It'll be fun. Um, extended producer responsibility, that's our bill, the Packaging Reduction and Recycling Act. If you get the details right, it does make a huge difference. We want to really focus on reduction, though. Traditionally, those programs are just a spin-off money for recycling, and that's good, but it's not going to solve the plastics problem. And Joe, I want to reserve 60 seconds for an announcement at the end. So just I'm used to that from you. Yeah, you are. Okay, that's right. <laughs> yes. This is another two-part two question, but you could choose just one. Um, 
one is, are there, is there any other country that you see as a model? Um, and the other question is, speculative, and I hope it doesn't seem silly or a waste of time, but if Gore had won the election, what would he have done first, do you think? Well, you're going way back. Okay. <laughs> oh, I like that question. Uh, so I'll do the last question. The, um, um, you know what? I don't, I mean, I, I, I know Alan like him, and I think he would have done great. But I think that the actual answer to that question is, don't vote for a third party next November. Uh, it's, it's, please, please not have another Trump presidency. If, I mean, I don't think the planet can take it, but I know that my psyche cannot endure it. So, you know, um, that would be good. I, I would also just like to, uh, if all of you, uh, whatever your uh, spiritual uh, or non-spiritual background is, but if you can uh, send uh, good vibes and birthday wishes to President Jimmy Carter, who turns Amen. 99. Amen. Did you want to ask, answer the other part of the question about a model? Germany. Germany. Okay, that was the one. Okay. Uh, what do we got? Who's left? Okay. Was there any? Okay. Okay, I think we can do this. Go ahead. I think uh, most of us in this room are probably grandparents. <laughs> we, need to, we need to reach the younger generation with this, and how do we do that? The best part of this work we're doing at the Third Act is that it's really in collaboration with kids. Um, and truthfully, it turns out that it's uh, the uh, intergenerational collaboration between people the age of grandparents and grandchildren is much easier than parent people, sort of parents and children's age. All grandparents love their grandchildren unconditionally, and all grandchildren are smart enough to cut their parents, their grandparents, some slack. You know, and so it works easily and it's been a lot of fun so come join us at third act because we do a lot of that now hi uh i'm a hairstylist and i sell specialty products for curly hair the company i buy now um, has transitioned from plastic to aluminum um yeah and it's been great and uh, another packaging system with cartons um, the price went up quite a bit what can i say to one person at a time uh, to convince them that this is the better way to go instead of worrying about how much they're spending because it went up because this is such a positive thing to eliminate the waste. It's important to me. I don't know how to impress upon them. What, what could I possibly say? The well, plastics are not cheap when you look at the damage done in environmental justice communities when it's produced and when it's disposed of. This is a really hard issue because we have to make it affordable and mainstream we don't want to go the route of where organic food was, say, 25 years ago. I remember when our son was little, um, Mark and I always worked for nonprofits, and so I bought organic um, apple juice for the baby. And one day, Mark was reaching into the refrigerator, and he tried to have a glass of that juice, and I snapped at him. I said, no, no, you drink the toxic apple juice. <laughs> The organic is for the baby, and, and that's how we managed, you know, working for nonprofits. And on plastics, we've got to make. And you did just fine. Good yeah, year. yeah. Um, we have to make plastic alternatives to plastics affordable and convenient for people. And that's why, like, I get so excited if you go to Trader Joe's, which is horrible on over-packaging produce, so I never get it there. But they're selling um, shampoo bars in little cardboard uh, boxes. So it's not like, you know, $40 to wash your hair. So it's demand, it's, you know, the more demand, the more the price will go down. Uh, would e each of you like to make a closing uh, statement of, of what we can do? You can even separate from your separate from your sixty seconds. Yeah, separate. Yeah. I'll just say this is a really good book. Books count, but they don't by themselves move the needle, which is why I write fewer of them and organize more now. But this is a really good book just to get yourself um, thinking. 
That's the that's the point of books is to kind of get the equipment upstairs lubricated and turning. And this is a really fine one by a really fine writer. I just want to say congratulations to Eve Shop. Um, this is an incredible book. Uh, it took a ton of work. You did it during COVID. Um, that's all I want to say, and then you'll come back to me. Yes, I will. <laughs> I, I just want to say, if you haven't read the book yet, and, and I know this is not the point of it, but my God, is it funny. It's, it's very, very, it's, it's just really fun to uh, read. Well, I'm glad you said that, uh, in part because that was my parting thought. I was so glad that Bill earlier brought up the idea of fun, that we have a lot of fun at our meetings. And, uh, yeah. You know, that, that's really important. I think it's pivotally important that we not lose heart and because that's, you know, next to losing hope. I think it's so important to understand, the, and we can have two minds and understand the dire seriousness of the situation that we may be in environmentally, in terms of human health, in terms of animals, in terms of climate change. We know all this, but we can still approach the work with a sense of fun and joy. I think that's so important. Just no glitter. No just glitter. no glitter. No, no, balloons. no, balloons. no balloons, no glitter, no Lego. Uh, also, thanks to our uh, underwriting support for this event comes from uh, Northshire Bookstore and our wonderful friends at Northshire, Northshire.com. A wonderful independent bookstore that's in our region that is uh, where you can get Eve's book and, of course, uh, should, there's a table outside and, and uh, Bill's books as well and uh, signing later. Also, thanks to the Southern Vermont Art Center. Uh, this is one of the most beautiful places. I don't know, by the way, if, you've, if you get a chance, the, there's a barn exhibit uh, of um, Liam Orton's, yeah. Orton, Orton, Lyman, Lyman Orton. Lyman Orton's uh, paintings. Uh, my God, they're beautiful. It's, it's a beautiful exhibit if you get a chance. Um, uh, so thanks to the Southern Vermont Art Center for the use of this space. Uh, we've been here many times and it's just a, a lovely, lovely uh, time to come back. And our final announcement comes from my dear friend, Judith Think. <laughs> so before coming here, I checked, and Northshire Bookstore is open until 7 p.m. tonight, and that's where I'm going next, um, my favorite bookstore of all, all kind. Um, so this, this, this afternoon was kind of the appetizer. If you want to go deeper on plastics, on Sunday, October 22nd, the Bennington Garden Club is doing a presentation with me and Beyond Plastics at Bennington College at one o'clock. There will be a PowerPoint. Um, <laughs> but I want to show you this beautiful quilt. Do you need help? Yeah. Up? One of our volunteers, Trish Ross from Lee, Massachusetts, made this. And, um, oh, look at that. That's amazing. And we're, we are selling raffle tickets. It's, I feel like I'm back in high school selling raffle tickets. <laughs> but for $20 today, you can buy a ticket and it'll all the proceeds go to beyond plastics let's show the back <laughs> isn't this nice so um this is the first time you know think about i always panic during the holidays i'm always surprised when they pop up on you so my colleague megan wolf and i have clipboards with qr codes and come buy a raffle ticket and you'll make someone happy if you win this book thank you and when is the drawing for the quilt? Uh, early December. Early December, excellent. So perfect for the, uh, the holidays. And many, many thanks, Joe, to you for getting us through this all. As always. <laughs>